Uh, good morning. My name is Preston Sarp, and um, today I'm going to do a few demos on how you can do batch or bash, sorry, bash related operations on a VM or to create a VM. So the infrastructure within Azure, right? You can use the Azure CLI uh, to create a machine, and once you've created a machine inside, uh, you can SSH to that system and perform. Uh, whatever commands you need. And there's a lot of options you have. Uh, so a virtual machine in the cloud uh, is a lot like you might uh, already be accustomed to using a virtualization platform uh, in your own on-premises environment. It's not much different, of course, as, as soon as you get into the operating system. But the cool part is in the cloud, you can automate a lot of the infrastructure components. So to build, uh, to provision a machine in Azure or AWS, as you know, or, or GCP, you can always, um, uh, create the vir whatever virtual networks and the components, the storage components of uh, any infrastructure um, solution, and then put the machine there and uh, do whatever you need to do. You have some interesting options there. Probably a lot like you'd have on your virtualization platform anyway, but uh, by now maybe uh, we, uh, we kind of intuitively know some of the benefits of cloud versus on-premises. Um, or some of the pros and cons and whether it's appropriate or not. So that's what uh, this uh, presentation is going to center around. And I don't have slides, so it's going to be mostly demo. And I uh, just wanted to give you a background of myself. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm really heavily focused more on the Microsoft side, on the Microsoft technologies. But I recently started climbing the learning curve in Linux. And to me, it doesn't matter that much uh, what the platform is, what the operating system is, as long as I get an opportunity to automate something, right? That, that's what really excites me. Um, and so let's, uh, let's just dive right in, and we'll start off. I'm going to authenticate to my, uh, one of my Azure subscriptions. And I'll use my MSDN. Okay, we are streaming now. Right, I forgot to um, <laughs> get the SSID here. Mark? What's that? The SSID is on the Oh, uh, it's Mosaic Lab. Okay. And I don't want to repeat the password. I know, I know, I'm not touching it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was just my email. Me. That was just my email with that. Use of it. All right, so I just authenticate to my Azure subscription, and in Azure, we have a Cloud Shell. So if you mouse over here to that little symbol that does look like PowerShell, it, and you click on it, though, you'll discover that it will open up as a batch. And if this is the first time, you notice down here at the bottom, you get two options. You can either run it in bash mode or PowerShell mode. And by the way, uh, even though it says PowerShell, behind the scenes, it's actually spinning up a Linux container, and that's what right. PowerShell is running on, a Linux container. So it's all about, you know, um, it's, it's more about non-Microsoft operating systems. Anyway, since October last year, mm -hmm. the number of non-Microsoft, which mostly means Linux-oriented uh, platforms that are in Azure, uh, exceeded the number of Microsoft operating systems. So that might be interesting to note. Uh, so the first time you open the cloud shell, you'll uh, be prompted to create a storage account that gets provisioned pre-automatically. You don't have to think about the name. 
So I'm going to say create storage in that particular subscription, and it's just going to spin up a, a, a storage account so that you can have you can upload files uh, to that storage account. Say uh, whatever your um, shell scripts, whatever shell scripts you want to use. So now it's creating or initializing uh, the account for the cloud shell. And that'll take just a few seconds. Gives you some metadata there about your subscription resource groups. So it also creates a resource group called, here you see it's cloud shell, where the storage account's gonna be guide. All right, so the cool thing about the, um, this is the Azure CLI. The cool thing about the Azure CLI is that it's very discoverable and it's in bash mode right now, as you can see if you look in the upper left hand corner here. You can select from the drop down PowerShell if you prefer. Uh, but in both cases, uh, it's running on some Linux container in the background. And the discoverability aspects of uh, the Azure CLI um, starts with just typing AZ. If you hit return without even the dash dash help parameter, or switch, it's going to show you all of the top level commands and you can go further down the list. For example, if I wanted to do something with a virtual machine, let me do AZ uh, VM and I'm like, okay, I'm brand new to this. I don't know what else to type. Let me do AZ VM and I need help. <laughs> so you call for help, H-E-L-P, right? Dash, dash. Is it possible to make your text larger? Yeah, uh, so that would be text size here. That's here. Large would be good. Medium. Large? Yeah. Let's try large. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so again, <laughs> if I just, and the up arrow key remembers, so AZVM help or AZ, um, AZ network, network. These are Azure commands? No, uh, oh. these are Azure well, yeah, they're, uh, they're related to the Azure infrastructure, but this is implemented since this bash. It's actually implemented uh, with, a, with a Python library. Originally, when we, uh, when we introduced the Azure CLI, it was based on um, Node.js, but we've converted since to, to Python libraries. So this is all based in the background of Python library. Is this running on your local machine or on the Azure instance you've logged into? This is running on Azure. And so, um, good, great question because I forgot to mention. So that, those are the two options you have. If you want and prefer to download the Azure CLI clients, you can do so. But remember, when you do that, uh, the disadvantage would be that you have to keep track of the updates. I mean, you'd have to update. It's not a big deal to update it on your system. And it doesn't matter what platform you have nowadays, because I've got I've got uh, Windows 10 here, but of course you know with the uh, with the subsystem for Linux with this. If uh, someone wanted to install that on their local machine on their Windows 10 machine, would they go to the Microsoft Store, or would there be some other means of installing it? It's um it's a link, and I have a an FAQs document. I don't know how many questions and answers I have, and there's okay. some screenshots. Uh, in some cases, probably over 100 uh, questions and answers, and I'm pretty sure that one is in there. And even if it's not in there directly, we have such great documentation now um, on, uh, uh, on our site that you can just uh, do a keyword search, go to Microsoft uh, uh, Azure and, and, and find it, or Azure CLI 2.0 as a keyword search. And what is that site, the website? Uh, the, the, the main site here, let me uh, go to it now. If you just go to Azure, um, what? Um, Oh, and full disclosure, if you haven't guessed by now, I'm, I'm a Microsoft employee. So documentation, if you click on documentation here, uh, then you'll get to see. You can do a search. So this gives people an opportunity to dig deeper. Yes, uh, like Linux virtual machine, have, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. deploy infrastructure, I click on that one. And, it, and then from here, you have these quick starts and let's say that you wanted to know everything about Linux virtual machines, right? If you go to your PDF, notice how it's divided into certain sections, like how to create a, a virtual machine using the Azure CLI, which is kind of what we're talking about. You can click into that uh, example for the quick starts if you just wanted to, a quick intro, or if you wanted to get a little bit more depth and hands-on, you can go to the tutorial section. Um, and so if you want to look at code samples or get some conceptual information, 
you can do all of that and then specific, specific how-to guides on creating a BM, how to secure it, how to use your SSH keys and all that sort of stuff. But if you wanted the whole kit and caboodle, you can click on this link at the bottom that says download PDF. And when you do that, it's going to uh, show that it's gonna, be, it's gonna be pretty extensive because that's like reading a whole book, right? And this is really the best option nowadays. A lot of these technologies, especially cloud stuff, uh, you try to go to Amazon and, and uh, to the library, to, to the bookstore and try to buy something relevant. And you might, even if you see it, if you buy something now, a year from now, things change so quickly. So this is really the best option because we have uh, all our technical writers that contribute uh, or even some of regular guys like me. I'm, I'm just an engineer, right? So uh, a field engineer. Um, yeah, sometimes we have the opportunity to contribute to, and this is the most up-to-date information. So this says what? 1,016 pages. <laughs> so if you have a little spare time on the weekends, uh, that'll be some light reading for you. Um, okay, so so that's um, so those are the two options. Download the CLI, but you just have to remember you'd have to keep updating it. That's the disadvantage. When Oh, and then authentication. You have to man manually authenticate, or you have to put in your, your credentials and specify and type it in uh, when you want to connect to your subscription in Azure versus what I'm doing now. I just came up here. After I've already authenticated to the Azure portal, I can click on that button and it will auto-authenticate because I've already authenticated, so it uses that pass-through authentication. Um, that's the advantage with using it this way from directly from the Azure portal. Another advantage is so you don't have to worry about, it's like SSO, right? You don't have to worry about that extra authentication step. You also don't have to worry about, guess what? Updating your version of the client because it's behind the scenes, it takes care, it's taken care of for you. Um, but one of the disadvantages, it's, it's more of an inconvenience. If I had downloaded the Azure CLI client, it's on my local machine. I, can, um, I, I have my local file system with all my shell scripts. Uh, that I can use, it's gonna be easier to access. That's not to say using this method, you can't do something similar because I can come right here and I can even create like a new folder. If you remember, it spun up a storage account in the background. Um, so that's storage accounts, or if you're more familiar with AWS, it's like the, uh, eight, the S3, S3, or S3 something, buckets yeah. and things yeah. like that, yeah. Um, so you can, you, can upload, you can upload files, uh, right? Upload and download files from here. Uh, it's just, since it's a web-based interface, it's not as convenient. Nothing's going to be as convenient and give you that more responsive user experience than if you have a client locally, right? So uh, those are the trade-offs between both options. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show... Uh, yeah, let's get rid of that. But that's where the documentation is. You can just start off at uh, uh, azure.com. And I have this file, so I'm using... VS Code, which is also cross-platform, um, whether you have a Linux or Mac OS system. And uh, pardon the red there, let me just uh, clear the screen. All right, so at the top, what the first thing I'm going to do is create a resource group. And a resource group is just a resource group is a container for all the resources that you're going to deploy, all the infrastructure components in Azure, right? And I'm going to create this resource group here. I think I need to authenticate first. So let's, um, oh no, sorry. Uh, I've already authenticated using the CLI. Let me swing this over to the other screen and then I'll just do it. Line that line. other screen isn't showing. Um, I know. Yeah, yeah okay. that's that's by design. Oh, okay. So I'm going to copy yeah. from over here, and then I can talk through it on this. Okay. Side. So here we go. So um, again, we we kind of covered a little bit of the discoverability features. So anything, it's so discoverable that if you if you're starting from scratch, um, just A Z give you everything, and then you can um, progressively expand your vocabulary by looking for the verbs, right? That you want to use. So in this case, I'm going to create a group. A group in this context means a resource group that all the resources are going to be inside of Azure. Um, I'm going to create and create it at the location. So the dash LS4 location is East US 2. Uh, that's one of our regions um, in Azure. There's probably going to be by the end of this year or so 50 regions. There's 
40 something now, and that's globally. Um, and each region has at least probably three data centers for redundancy. So a region is not a one-to-one -one map where we say East US 2 means that there is one Azure data center. There are multiple Azure data centers per region, right? Um, so I'm gonna create this resource group in the East US 2 region. I'm gonna call it RG38 or I'll, I'll make it RG39. And I'm just using, the you see the current time on my clock is 1039, so that's how I come up with it. It's just some arbitrary number. There's an actual standard that we recommend if you look in our documentation for how to name your resources, including your resource groups. But just for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'll call it RG39 here. And, uh, and with the verbose switch, it's gonna give me the results in JSON, uh, JSON notation. Uh, so if you wanted to log that or, or you know, reuse it again, you, you can. All right, so that's RG39. And then the sequence, typically, if you're going to create a virtual machine, it needs some place to live. So maybe the next thing we can consider creating is the virtual network. And so the virtual network is just your entire network space that you want. And I said RG38 isn't going to be there, right? Because this is before I was using RG38. So I need to correct that. And it'll tell you. So you see how the error message is. It's pretty discoverable. It's kind of forgiving. Our resource group RG38 could not be found. So that's, um, we, we know that because we, we, we changed it to RG39. And so um, it's going to create the virtual network. And again, JSON output and everything, especially if you use that verbose switch, right? Um, it'll give you all of the details for that virtual network. Mm -hmm. And that uh, JSON format, by the way, if you want another method you can use to deploy um, with using automation that you can deploy resources, you can provision resources, you can use to provision resources in an automated fashion is called, is ARM templates, which is a, a bunch of JSON uh, templates that you can use Either by themselves, you can use an Azure DevOps, which means put it in the pipeline, right? And get um, some sort of credential uh, to perform the deployment that has access to your subscription. You can use PowerShell. You can use uh, this method, Azure CLI, right? And just point to where those ARM template files are. You can have a main ARM template with sub-templates or nested templates, which is like in a script when you have a main script and you have these functions. And the idea behind that is like with microservices, right? The main script, if you put everything into one giant script, then it kind of gets monolithic. But if you can break things up into individual templates, um, then it becomes more manageable and you can delegate the creation and maintenance of those components to different teams. If it's a specialized set of teams, like all the networking stuff, you can have the network team author and test and run uh, their um, virtual network creation arm template, sub arm template, right? That that is get called from the main template. Then your deployment people, when they deploy, just pull whatever is actually there. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like a function call within the main template. You 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 have a piece of the code yeah. that would just refer or link to that um, nested template for each resource, and you could do it in different ways. Like you can have an, a sub template. Uh, to deploy a particular resource category or sets of resources. For example, a virtual machine, you can have a sub-template that deploys that from the main template, or you could have a set of virtual machines because that nested template can iterate through and actually deploy multiple item th items. There's, a, there's a, a function in JSON that you can use, uh, the copy index function, that will say uh, if you wanted like three virtual machines instead of one, right? That'll make it easy for you. But anyway, I digress. Um, so that's our virtual network, and the next thing we want to do after we create a virtual network is a subnet within the virtual network. So on-premises, um, that's like creating a VLAN, right? So this is where our virtual machine is going to live now, within that larger scope virtual network address space. And so I think, oh, did I? Yeah, I should have known. So I have to change the resource group name again to 39. I probably shouldn't have changed it from the 38 originally, but that's okay. Uh, the other scripts, and what does it say here? It says the uh, hub East US VNet on the resource group. I think that might be a typo. So uh, when I, if I were to look up here, my East US East U, I forgot the S before the two. You see that? Mm -hmm. So 
So let's take out the yes here then. I know that's not correct, but it matches. Um, so now that should, that should work. And I forgot to put that little verbose at the end. But you see how it still gives me that JSON output. So not a big deal. And so now that I've created the subnet within the virtual network, I should be able to uh, continue creating. Let's create this. It's called an NSG for Network Security Group. It's really just a virtual firewall that is, exists outside of the machine that we're going to provision. So you don't have to worry about IP tables and hooking up firewalls that way at the operating system level. At this point, this is a virtual, uh, this is a component that you can create and then you define the inbound and outbound rules as necessary. That's step two. Step three would be to associate that network security group, NSG, just think virtual firewall, to uh, the subnet that we've just created. So let's, um, let's paste that in here. And so I, I'm always going to make mistakes with the RG38. So you know what? I'm going to switch over to typing uh, it instead. So it's going to be AZ network. Uh, and you see the format, you, you kind of get accustomed maybe to the, uh, to the syntax now. AZ network NSG create. So, um, so the noun comes before the verb, right? It's not like in English where, it's more like German where it's not may I please have a cup of coffee. It's like may I please a cup of coffee have. So NSG uh, create name is LNX. East US2. US2 or U2? In this well, case. this is the NSG resource, and I, I know it's not going to match the subnet resource, but I'm, I'm just correcting it here. Uh, and then the resource group. So some of these, you can see when you do the uh, dash dash help. So if I, if I did instead AZ network dash dash help or AZ network NSG create dash dash help, it'll give me the syntax for things like the resource group. And some of these, not all, but some of them you can abbreviate. So instead of dash dash resource dash group, I could have said, uh, I, I could have used dash G, which is an abbreviation or, or an alias for it. But generally speaking, I don't like using aliases because it doesn't give you, it, it, it doesn't explicitly state what you're doing, especially if you're new, new resource group. And the resource group is RG39. I'm not gonna get that one anymore. Uh, location. I could use dash L or I could spell it out, which is more, you know, that's more readable uh, location. But whenever you spell it out, it requires two dashes. If it's an abbreviation, it's going to be one dash, so location. But that's defined as a syntax anyway, is East US 2. And so that's, oh, what did I forget to do? Yes. The, no, verbose, I, you know, but see, it gives you the JSON output anyway. All right, so, and now, that's our NSG, and it's just a blank slate, although it does have, by the way, some default inbound and outbound rules to allow any machine. So you create a virtual network, and you create these subnets, and then in different subnets within that same virtual network, you build these virtual machines and put them in the same VNet. Anything in the same VNet uh, will have VNet to VNet communication allowed automatically through NSGs as part of the NSG default rules. Okay. As well, uh, you're gonna, by default, have outbound access to the internet, right? Uh, that, that's allowed. So if you spin up a brand new machine, whatever platform, doesn't matter, you're gonna have outbound access to the internet. It's, it's it, I mean, but being aware of that, that's why where NSGs come, comes in. You can modify those. You can't actually change the default rules, but you can change the priority of new rules that you specify to have a higher priority number, which numerically is a lower number, but that, that gets processed um, that, that gets processed before the higher so block traffic by modifying the priority. Right, right. Yeah, because the, the default rules have these high numbers at the end, 65,500 and so on. Uh, so you just have to specify a rule. The range is from 1 to 4096, right? For the default, for the custom rules that you specify to restrict traffic outbound if that's what you want to do. So that's just the bare bones NSG right now. And from here, uh, we can start uh, creating the rules. So I'm gonna create this rule and this one. You know what, since, since I'm not showing this screen, I'm gonna bump it down so I have some more real estate on this other money. They'll give me one second. All right, so this rule is create. I'm gonna create the rule. And it's gonna be AZ, NS, uh, AZ network, because NSG is a network component. AZ network 
NSG rule create and then all of the required um, parameters. Basically, we're going to allow SSH, right? Um, and it would look something like this. And I'm going to put those this time. Um, and let's see. The following arguments are required. Priority, okay, so that might have been something new. I haven't run this in a, in a long time. So let's look at where we should put priority. I do have priority, but I think the problem is the, with the carriage returns. So just like in bash, right, you can use that, you can use that um, backslash as a line break. So I'm gonna do it this way. So line break there. And then and you still have this 38. And I still have 38, and the priority, it looks like I, I'm using a one dash, and it should have been two dashes. So let's fix all of that then. Yeah, let's see if we can clean this up. And this is good if you're, I mean, I haven't played this with, with this in a while, but you get to see some of the, some of the features of uh, doing it properly, <laughs> making mistakes. So... Good lesson in hacking the AZ command line. Yeah. So uh, name NSG, all right, and I may have to type this one out. Ouch. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's the wrong one. Okay, we'll go through it. All right. So NSG rule that's allow SSH inbound is the name. And then we can go to the next line. And for the next line, let's see. Uh, you know what? I should probably do the same here. It's because I didn't have the backslashes. So I can actually fix that. If I come over here, and this will be easier. So in my VS Code uh, script, scriptlet, I'm going to uh, NSG. And I do have only one dash for priority. So that was an error anyway. I'll just pick up the backslashes here. Then I'll paste everything in. So backslash there. Uh, be a little easier, and if you want to put like just one parameter, uh, um, name and value on, uh, and then the line break, that would make it more readable. But I'm gonna, uh, I think I'm, for time's sake, I'm gonna combine them a little bit. So let's see, backslash there, and yeah, it's just easy to make mistakes. Uh, one dashes compared to two dashes. So. But the key, again, is if it's an alias, it's only one dash, and if it's not, it's two dashes for all these switches. All right, and then let me uh, change this to RG39. And then I'll, I'll go through it, I'll read through it. So, quick check, priority, resource group, protocol, source port range, destination port range is 22, source IP, uh, source address prefix. All right, so here we go. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure what the boss is. Which is just doesn't require a name. Uh, and I'll just cancel out of that. Um, okay, just cancel. That should work now. <coughs> what? Um, destination, destination, address prefixes, all right, destination, address, prefixes, for destination, oh, I see what happened. Is it case sensitive? Um, no, it oh. should, well. See, so SSH is uh, capital S. I don't know if that's you know what? Let me ch let me check. I know generally in, in Linux things are case sensitive, and I'm coming from primarily. Linux but that was just argument syntax. If that was the case there, with the, just the dash. Yeah, I think I missed the dash. That's all. Because it's a, if you look at source source address prefix, it has a right. Dash. So I'm um, gonna fix that in the source there as well. Yeah, but if it doesn't work, it's not going to do anything. It'll tell you what the error is. You can go back and fix it. So it's pretty forgive it, forgiving in this interactive mode. And um, let's let me let me see if the case matters actually. I've never tested that before. SSH. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. So if it's running, that's a good indication, unless it's some other logical error. Probably answers your case sensitive and uh, question. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. description, it shouldn't matter. I can see where you add the dash. And, uh, oh, yeah, that, that is description, which is some arbitrary text you put in. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'll test it on another command then. So there you go. That's the For inbound rule. Uh, you're going to allow SSH mm -hmm. from uh, the destination prefix is virtual network. It's just a tag. Instead of saying, okay, my destination network, the whole VNet has this address space. Uh, you don't have to say that. You can just simply say virtual network because zero will understand what it means that if anything inside internally in that virtual network you just created. And then for the, of course, the direction is inbound and uh, you've got some subscription IDs here. That ID actually refers to uh, the virtual network uh, within that resource group RG39. Um, oh, no, it continues. That ID, sorry, is actually the network security group name is this that we specified and uh, the security rule. So that is the name of the security rule that we just created, actually. And that lets you SSH into this um, instance. Right, right. Priority is 1,000 TCP uh, provisioning state. This is the key here to make to, to see if it provisioned correctly is that provisioning state will be succeeded. And then the source address prefix means anything coming from the internet, anything coming you know externally outside um, would be allowed in. So that's 12.89 uh, seconds. And then I'll have to break this one down. So there's a couple of more rules, and I'm just going to do the same thing. And uh, the other rules I'm going to add will be for 443 and 80. Um, but so it's the same process. I would just change the rule number uh, pretty much. And for this, actually, yeah, for the sake of time, I'm not going to add those. You get the idea. Uh, so this is just SSH is the most important one. But now, so that's a part of the, that's step two of the three-step process where you create the NSG, you define the rules, either inbound or outbound. In this case, it's an inbound rule to support uh, 22 SSH. And then you associate that NSG to the particular subnet um, you're interested in protecting because that then, after we do that, then we create the, the virtual machine. Well, there's still a few things we need to do as prerequisites before we actually create the virtual machine. Um, if you're on the portal, just pointing and clicking, you can just you can simply create a virtual machine, and it's gonna it's gonna hold your hand and guide you and say, okay, well, by the way, you're gonna need a NIC and so on. But if you're doing it programmatically, whether it's in, in an interactive fashion or if you're gonna use ARM templates or PowerShell or Bash with ARM templates and whatever, um, then it's better and you have more control by creating all of the prerequisite components before you actually create the virtual machine. What I mean by that is uh, if you know that your, your, your machine is going to need a public IP address, which by the way, unless you have some sort of VPN connection in that you create, um, you're going to go over the internet to a public IP address to port 22 to get in, right? So the machine is going to have a public IP address resource. It's going to have a network interface card that's actually created as a separate resource besides the virtual machine. I mean, it can be if you do it programmatically. So you do that, you do that, you create a storage account uh, so that the diagnostic logs have somewhere to go when you create the machine, right? Um, for, for syslog and so on. And then after you have those prerequisites, of course, the virtual network and the subnet, uh, after you have those prerequisites, then, and, and oh, the NSG, uh, not to mention things like, what is it called? The um, availability set to give you some resiliency if you have two machines that are, um, that have the same role, if these are going to be Apache um, machines or what is it, uh, the, um, some LAM stack supporting an application, right? You can have multiple of those behind a firewall. So it can get really complex. But anyway, those are some of the prerequisites. And then you create the virtual machine so that once you create the virtual machine, it'll just fall into place and connect to all of those prerequisite components. Uh, when you're ready. So that's, uh, so the next thing we're going to create then is the, we created the rule and then we have to associate the NSG with the subnet. Uh, it's actually called, um, in, in terms of the command, it's updates, it's uh, AZ network VNet subnet update. So within the VNet, right, uh, the subnet within that VNet, we're going to update it with the property of the NSG that we've just created which is that virtual firewall. So let me just format this with the dashes uh, first. Uh, do a backslash there and do, change that to RG39. Do a backslash 
here as well. And then do a refresh dash for this. Okay, so it says unrecognized argument vnet. Yeah, because I have only, only one dash for vnet. It should have been two dashes. So that should have been dash dash. And the, the sequence of, if it's if it's two words or two um, for the resource, there's usually a double dash and then a dash, uh, for like dash dash vnet then dash name, right? So let me do that again. Yeah, lots of typos in this one, but it's a good luck learning opportunity and then this time um, and maybe verbose isn't supported for this one huh uh, mm -hmm. so I thought it was universal so network security group is that resource uh, so it's saying the virtual network on the resource group 39 is not found and the reason for that is why any guesses you remember when we initially created that um, mm -hmm. virtual network, we uh, misspelled it, so it should have been put back to S for, I think, in here. And that still was not found. And if it wasn't found, we can just ch cheat and come into here. Let's refresh the screen. And then we'll look under RG39 and look for uh, the actual name of the virtual network to pin it down. And So this is a way of having the best of both worlds. You have the GUI interface where you can get the information you need, and then you can refine it with the command line. Exactly, yeah. and even this, you see how I, I can maximize and minimize it? Um, I can even rip it out and put it on another screen if I want to, let me see. Yeah, if you had like a dual monitor set yeah, or something. Yeah, that's what I have here. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, so this is, yeah, this is That should be a problem. Oh, I think it's a it's a site. You have to you have to browse to uh, once you you're in here. You can just browse to another tab and um, something like Azure CLI, and it'll pop up in, a, in its own separate window. But anyway. Uh, yeah, let's check out the name. I can minimize it. I'm going to check out the name of the virtual network hub East YouTube VNet. Let's copy it from there. We'll get to the bottom of this. And if I click on that toggle again, the cloud show. Alright, so it says. East and the resource was not found at all. But it's still referring to Hub East US2 DNET, although we changed the name to East U2. Oh, the VNet, because that's a subnet. Got it. So the VNet name is over here. So the uh, VNet. The VNet name East US2 is actually the same, but it's, I mean, the subnet name is the same, but it's the VNet name that I made the error on the typo, so it should be that one right there. All right, so there we go. And let me expand this now. So after the VNet, then we can do this. Updating the resource group name to RG39 and this one to a backslash. And then we have the name is to basic. I'm going to check my dashes now.
So now we can create a public IP address. I'm going to get some illustrator here so you can see better. Public IP address, if I paste this in. So AZ Network Public IP is the name of the resource we're going to create it in resource group RG39. I'll give it that name. Uh, the convention I normally use, this is common, is just do a dash PIP at the end to indicate it's a public IP address resource, as well as the uh, allocation method, which, see, I would have made a mistake because it's two dashes for allocation. So um, I'll just... Where do you find the address space in that command? The address space. No, you, oh, you let the system assign its yeah, public yeah, IP. Yeah, okay, okay. that, that part is handled for you behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so do that again with the two dashes. Let's see. I don't know if it's, yeah, it doesn't work for some reason. I don't know why. The, the DNS name, because it has to be unique um, overall, and of course, public DNS. I just put a prefix there, but you can use something like the UUID gen and generate like some sort of prefix and then append it automatically also in your script um, to give it some randomness. Or you can do a, a, a dig and see if it's there first as part of the check and if it's available, then take it. And, you know, you could get really fancy with all that. So that was the public IP address. The public IP address, as you saw, is, uh, is instantiated as a separate resource. And then you're gonna create the NIC for the virtual machine. Um, also as a separate resource. That might sound weird, but then what, what's gonna happen afterwards is you associate that public IP address to the NIC, and then later on you associate the virtual machine to the NIC, where at that point the virtual machine would have the public IP address. How do you get it to tell you what public IP address it gave to this you one, so you could go into it from the outside? Right here. So if okay. I look at, um, well, that's the DNS label we provided, right? So if we can't get it directly, so you we, dig can, get that it, or we can do a dig and get it. Um, I thought it would give us that as well anyway. But no, it doesn't, it doesn't actually show you here. Uh, and that's why I wanted to do for everything. I wanted to do the, um, the verbose to see if it gives you some more output. But yeah, you would just have to do a lookup for this. Uh, or you can just switch, switch over here. Let's refresh the screen. And then we should see an RG39, uh, the public IP address resource that got created, which is this right here. Once you click on it, it will show you in the portal what that value is. I know this is kind of like a point and click method, but let's see what's the IP address. Why didn't it give us the IP address? Well, let's see if this is going to result in anything. Hmm. So that, that might be a problem for uh, let's go back. Mm. Yeah, it because it should have been it should have been here. I don't know uh, if I forgot. So AZ network public IP address create name, allocation method, location, skew, basic, and uh, the reverse doesn't support it. So if we go back up like right here, let's do this. Um, let's do a dash dash help and see if there's maybe a property for that. So public IP address prefix. Version IP address type. Now we do not have a version in there, so let me try that. Maybe that's, uh, this is, it will always show you the required arguments. So be, at a minimum, uh, these, are the re, these are the required switches, right? Name and resource group. And it did default, a, it was in the output tag. IPv4. What's that? It did default to IPv4 in the output. Oh, it did. IP address. Public address version. Right there. Where your cursor. Oh, that, that okay. Line. Okay, good. And the provisioning state has succeeded. I don't know why we don't see it then. Um, that's good. Do another refresh. No, it, it didn't spin up. Okay, so that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue because uh, mm -hmm. I'm running out of time. But uh, so that's the, that's how you would create an IP address, and then the next thing we can do is create the what's this RG39 and backslash. This is how you create the nick backslash there. Backslash here, 
And then a quick check of the dash dashes. Dash dash dash, okay, everything looks good so far. Location and network security group, so networking false, subnet, vnet, uh, take off the S if I made a mistake there. All right, this should work. So this is just creating the NIC, and you see the pattern now, right? It's still a network resource, so it's AZ network, NIC create, and uh, network security group, unrecognized arguments, network. I bet it's going to be network dash security dash group. Yeah, let me see network security group to make sure from before. Let's try that. I'm checking it up here. Yep, okay, so that worked. It didn't say creating or anything, but we created the network um, interface. And after the network interface, then we will have to, uh, oh, we did that part already, associate the NSG with the subnet. Yeah, we did that. We do network create the rule. Oh, yeah, because we skipped a couple of rules, that's why. We created the public IP, then we created the NIC. And then uh, when we created the NIC, you'll notice in the command that part of the NIC creation, the initial NIC creation, is the association of the public IP address. So we put that in as a property, right? The public IP. So we create the public IP first, and we create the NIC. As we create the NIC, we indicate we want to associate it with that public IP that we just uh, provisioned. And now, um, drum roll, here's the part where you create the virtual machine. So. Uh, the virtual machine, uh, let me change the resource group name, RG39, and we've got a SKU, we've got mix, operating system disk name, and the operating system disk size, and so the SSH key value is obtained from this interface, it's because it's you've got that it's backed by that storage storage account. Mm -hmm. So you have some you have your profile where your your um, ID underscore RSA uh, private key is located. There's a public private key with the same name, but the public one is dot public, of course. And so that's what's used for authentication. So you can actually specify SSH authentication using this method. And so you would need a way to copy your private key onto your local machine in order to communicate with the with the instance. To your local machine, right, right, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that that'll be handled by the platform for you when you, when you do this this command. Uh, I'm not sure if verbose is going to be supported, so I'll just do it without. I'll try it without verbose. Uh, let me try to work with those. If it errors out, I'll just up error and take off of those. Not a big deal. So let me just do a quick check of my dashes. That's where I usually run into problems. Image, Nix, OS disk, and then I'll talk through it briefly. Authentication type. That's, yeah, so that's part of the authentication type. So let's uh, get some real estate here. And actually, let's do a clear at the top. And then we'll paste it in. All right, so we're going to create, AZVM create is to create a virtual machine. That's the name of the VM. We're going to create LNX1 AZVM, and the resource group is 39. Who dies not stick storage? I didn't want to do that, so let me just, I have to fix that too. I use that prefix in brackets, right? So let's put in a real prefix here. But we can just use something like, um, or suffix at the end of the storage account to make it kind of unique in DNS. 11.13 is the current time. I'll use that value. 
And so let's uh, try this again. So I forgot about the storage. The storage account, because it has to be globally unique in DNS as well, uh, and it has to be uh, at least three characters, no more than 24 characters. It's got to be lowercase letters only and numbers. Dashes aren't supporting, no special characters, no uppercase letters. So you have to you know, conform to that. Of course, you could use UID gen and come up with an alphanumeric character and append it or to a, a certain suffix or use it as a suffix uh, for the storage account name. Uh, size. So maybe there's not a standard D1, V2 anymore. Uh, and if I come up here. A2, let me try A2, B2. These are the like t-shirt sizes for the virtual machine, so standard. I'm gonna use A2, B2. Hmm. Um, standard, spelling that right. So the sizes, I guess I could enumerate the sizes and see. But if I don't, and I don't, oh, oh, I see what happened. You guys see that? You guys caught that too? Can you tell? One dash. I looked at, I tried to find it, but I, I didn't see. Should have been size size. And uh, so for the disk size in gigabytes, no such file directory. Okay, so let's do um, LS. that was provided by default. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we, we changed the default uh, uh, location, but at that in your home directory, you should there should be there should have been a dot a, a hidden dot ssh to, uh, folder that by default I'm pretty sure uh, it's by default you didn't have to create it. It's going to be um, your ssh key pair. So then in that case, I would just have to create it anyway. Um, I, I'm way off time here because I've got to leave, so I'll just talk through it. Again, the idea is you create a virtual machine, uh, then name, resource group, boot diagnostic refers to the storage account that you're going to use, so that's going to be something unique in DNS. That's just the prefix, though. After the storage account name you see here, it's going to be something like dot um, blob or dot, you know, whatever, um, microsoft.4.net, you know, with the suffix. There's a DNS suffix all storage account resources. Location, the storage SKU in the standard LRS, that means locally redundant storage, that means your storage account, it's replicated three times by default when you spin up a virtual machine within a particular cluster or uh, compute and, or storage cluster. That means the storage system, the, the set of thousand virtual machines in this one rack, in this one huge rack of like approximately thousand machines. It's replicated synchronously three times when you create a, a virtual machine. Local and redundant storage means that's only in that one particular cluster, as opposed to geo-redundant storage, which means not only does it get replicated there, but now asynchronously gets replicated to a designated peer region. Could be across the states, you know, but there's a designated peer region that you also have three copies that get replicated in a asynchronous manner as well. Um, and then the image is CentOS, the size of standard A2V2, which is one of the smaller ones. That's the NIC property that we, the NIC we just created, and the OS disk name. Uh, we're going to give it a, a name uh, for the OS disk and specify that the size in gigabytes should be 32 gigs. The authentication type we were shooting for was SSH, and the SSH key value would have been, um, you know, getting that uh, from our home directory, uh, the hidden SSH directory. Uh, ID, RC, if you didn't oh. have a .ssh 
a folder on that machine and it's trying to get to that because it's got the tilde there. It's looking for your whole fo right. home folder. I'm wondering if that's where the error is coming from. It's looking for something it's not finding. Oh, so if I do, you do this one. But you had looked for it before and it wasn't there. You were talking about manually creating it. Yeah, you can manually, uh, so you would just manually No, but if it's not there, but if it's not there right now and, it, and the command's looking for it, then that would be something that would, would, would yeah, but it's, it's, as I remembered, I think when you when you get your cloud shell, you would. I don't know if we, I'm, that's what I that's what I don't remember. Then if it was always there by default, or if it's you, you just have to create it. It so looked it like it's so looking for a resource that's not there, and that might be where we're coming. Yeah. We're running into it here. So that would have been the last part, yeah. uh, you know. But I really I really have to uh, cut it short, unfortunately. But uh, if you look in the resource with thirty nine, you have all the prerequisites now. So if I. You, you see, you have the virtual network, you have the public IP address, and you should have the NIC. If I do a refresh, see that's the NIC interface. So that's what all of the that's what the uh, resources look like. If we go to the uh, and I don't know why the public IP address didn't have an actual public IP address, but if we look at the uh, the NSG, these are the default rules. That it, if I go to our inbound rules, you'll see these are default, the 6500 and greater. But this is the one we created, which is allowed. SSH inbound uh, for port 22, anywhere from the internet coming into the virtual network. And if I just wanted to not be confused or distracted by the default rules, I can just click on this toggle and you see what are uh, the custom rules that you create. So, um, so, so I apologize for having to cutting it short, uh, but you know, I really have to, to go now. And that's, uh, and what I'll do is I'll send, uh, Mark, I'll send you that okay. FAQs document. Okay. From there, you'll get an idea of some of the uh, some of the links that are relevant to, to Linux on Azure, and you can do um, you can do things like resize the disk. You can you can hook up LVNs. You can RAID configuration. So almost just about anything. Once you get the machine up there, uh, or if you're going to migrate, you can even <coughs> customize um, you can even customize an image if you want to send your image to Azure. Send it to the that um, blob storage account or storage account, which is like an S3 bucket. And from there, that hard drive that you upload, uh, you can then use to push out an image. Because if, if, um, if, you, if you create that, um, uh, yeah, if you create the image first on premises, you just have to convert it to a VHD format, a VHD format, fixed disk, not dynamic, and you have to do things like make sure you don't have a specific a static IP address assigned because the f service fabric in Azure will automatically, they hand out IP addresses dynamically using DHCP, uh, although you can specify static, which really just makes it a permanent reservation, right? So things like that. Uh, and install on-premises if you're going to customize and create your image. Uh, you also need, you can download and install the uh, Azure uh, the, the Linux, the Linux client, Linux is your client, so it's going to be the one that will enter on the machine, will interact with the fabric controller to to get to communicate and get like the uh, change the the name of the machine and get the uh, DHCP provided IP address and a bunch of other stuff, right? So um, and then you can and you can update that. Uh, it's like an agent, and you can uh, do all that. So. You, so the sky's the limit. At that point, anything they are custom to doing on premises, you can do in Azure as well. So any any questions? I can probably only take one <laughs> if there's like a burning question. I had one real mm -hmm. quick question. You're in Microsoft uh, Edge here on a Windows 10 machine. Is it possible to do the commands you were talking about from a Bash terminal on a Linux machine? Yes, yes, because the yeah. Azure CLI, uh, the Azure CLI yeah. client, um, is cross plat I mean, there's a version for, for Mac OS and Linux as well. So you don't have to be an Edge, you could be in something like Chrome or Firefox yes, to you talk can, to the it. The browser don't, don't matter, yeah, either. And so you could do all this, you know, from a Linux machine. Oh, and yeah. talk to the it's, Azure. Yeah, because uh, you're just going yeah. over the web. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can. All right, yeah. so um, so great. So I uh, really have to run now, guys, but uh, you know, thanks for your attention and participation and everybody that's watching this online, thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Sounds great. And uh, when I get the files from you, I'll, I'll push them up to the uh, GitHub repository. Okay. And it's obvious there's no way you'll cover, anyone could cover all of this in one session. Right, so right. Uh, there's more to go. Thank you very much, Preston. Okay. Th thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone.